Hello and welcome. This Week in Amateur Radio is North America's premier amateur radio and technology news narrowcast and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for a release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1208 of This Week in Amateur Radio. As we come to air, the FCC has notified the Volunteer Examiner Program that it is currently unable to process new applications or accept examination fees due to their computer network being down. The Dayton Hamvention is returning to the Greene County Fairgrounds after nearly three years of COVID shutdowns. We will have an in-depth report. An amateur radio operator is hoping to become the oldest person to cross the Pacific solo. We will have the story. The Voice of America Museum in Bethany Station will be open extended hours during Hamvention. We will have two reports. Amateurs in Hawaii demonstrate their communication skills during a simulated emergency test. Several organizations around the planet celebrated World Amateur Radio Day 2022. We will have all the details. Do you know the role that the International Telecommunications Union plays in amateur radio? Well, we will have what you need to know. The country of Germany is ready to welcome thousands of visiting amateurs to their version of Hamvention, which is called Ham Radio Expo, and it is being held in Friedrichshafen, Germany. And scientists are getting ready for another interstellar transmission as they ready to broadcast the structure of human DNA, Earth's location in the galaxy, and other information for curious aliens. We will have the story. All of that and a lot more is coming up in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, BK6FLEB, will talk about Whisper and answer the question, how far can you go? Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, We'll talk about the European GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and how it is affecting internet users around the world. And he will tell us how researchers recently stopped a cyber attack to the Ukrainian power grid. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues his mini-series on Amateur Radio's Fallen Flags with a look back at a little radio startup from Chicago called Helicrafters. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, covers everything you need to know to install and maintain your tower and antenna installation for your station. This week, he'll be looking at how you can make tower mounting hardware from scraps you may have around your house. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in the mountains outside of Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from my home studio in the sleepy town of Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Foxtrot, 2 Foxtrot. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where some of the first leaves of spring are beginning to open on the trees, I'm Eric, KD2. RJX. And reporting from our soggy amateur radio studios in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're still digging out from 12 inches of mostly snowy, slushy ice and broken trees and three days of emergency power, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. The ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator reported on Friday that the FCC Universal Licensing System and Electronic Batch Filing System has been down since midday Tuesday, April 19th, 2022, which is the day the FCC application fees became effective for amateur radio. On Wednesday, in a notice to all Volunteer Examiner Coordinators, the FCC asked them to refrain from submitting any session or application files while they work to resolve the issue. 
AWRL-VEC manager Maria Soma, AB1FM, said the FCC did not estimate how long the system would be down. Some applications were processed through the system before the FCC notice was released to the VECs. Applicants should expect delays with license and application processing. AWRL-VEC will provide an update when the FCC communicates that the filing system is back online. And as we come to air with this story, the AWRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator has reported that the FCC Universal Licensing System Electronic Batch Filing System is indeed back online and functioning normally. The AWRL advises that VECs may resume transmitting sessions and applications. The backlog of files will be processed through the system. The Dayton Hamvention is just a month away, and the Greene County Fairgrounds are ready to welcome back the world's largest amateur radio show for the first time in almost three years of being shut down due to the COVID pandemic. Thousands of amateur radio operators will come to the grounds of the Greene County Expo Center for the return of Hamvention. An estimated 30,000 visitors will bring in upwards of $30 million worth of money into the Miami Valley economy. Rick Alnut, Hamvention Chairperson for 2022, said the event will be important for local businesses. He also said he is pleased to not have to check vaccination statuses or enforce a mask mandate. Everyone was wanting to get back to normal, Alnut said. Michael Kelter with the event's media relations told News Center 7's Mike Campbell that tickets and booth space were selling fast. Event goers like to communicate with each other and they like the camaraderie, Coulter said. Rodney Keetel, Greene County Expo Center Manager, said he's glad to see Hamvention return, as well as many other events. He said they have every weekend booked in 2022, a welcome change from the last two years during the pandemic. It's been a pretty tough time. We have lost a lot of shows, not really lost, but postponed a lot, Keetel said. The Hamvention team was interviewed by WHIO News Center 7, and here is an excerpt from that report. Green County will welcome the world's largest amateur radio show. This will be the ham first Hamvention, I should say, since COVID hit. And News Center 7's Mike Campbell shows us what to expect this year and how much money Hamvention could bring to our area. It's been almost three years since a Hamvention was held here at the Green County Fairgrounds. They bill that event as the largest gathering of amateur radio operators in the world. Everybody was wanting to get back to normal. This was the view from Sky 7 during the last version of Hamvention in 2019. Thousands of radio operators, known as hams, crowding the grounds of the Greene County Expo Center and Fairgrounds. It's even more crowded on the ground with vendor booths and buyers looking for gear. An estimated 30,000 visitors pumping upwards of $30 million worth of money into the Miami Valley economy. This is extraordinarily important to local businesses. Rick Allnut is the Hamvention chairperson for 2022. He's pleased the event is back and very pleased they won't have to check vaccination status or enforce a mask mandate. We'll certainly apply anything that the state of Ohio tells us that we need to. It's roaring back right now. It's coming back amazingly quick. Michael Coulter said tickets and booth spaces are selling fast for Hamvention 2022. People are anxious to see other people with the same amateur radio hobby as them. Ham operators really like to communicate with each other and they like camaraderie. People are very anxious to get out. They're, they're excited to get out, do things um, when it starts warming up here as well. I'm sure that uh, we will be very crowded. Rodney Cadle is the expo manager for Greene County. He's glad to see Hamvention return as well as many other events. They have every weekend booked in 2022, a welcome change from the last two pandemic years. It's been pretty tough. We've lost uh, a lot of shows that not really lost, but postponed a lot. Over the last three years, it's been pretty lonely here at the fairgrounds, just horses and their handlers. But now Hamvention and a number of other events are planning to make their return and bring business back here. In Xenia, Mike Campbell, News Center 7. That clip courtesy of WHIO News Center 7 in Ohio. According to the Southgate Amateur News Service, Japan's most well-known yachtsman, an octogenarian adventurer, is hoping to become the oldest person to cross the Pacific Ocean alone. And of course, he will be on the air. Back in 1962, Kenichi Hori became the first man to cross the Pacific Ocean alone, non-stop. 
He was 23 when he ended his journey from Japan 94 days later, docking his yacht in the U.S. city of San Francisco. Now at the age of 83, the seasoned sailor is on his way and ahead of schedule to becoming the oldest person to cross that ocean again. 60 years later, he is making the trip in reverse. He left San Francisco on March 26th on a yacht measuring 19 feet, or 5.8 meters, stocked with food, water, a satellite phone, and his preferred method of communication, an amateur radio. Although no call sign was listed for him on QRZ.com, Southgate Amateur Radio News reported it as JR3JJE. According to a report in the Asahi Shimbun, the prospect of a contact with him at amateurs back home in Japan adding extra-large antennas in the hopes of scoring some big DX. According to news reports, propagation has been something of a challenge for most. There's still time for a QSO, however. Kenichi was spotted near Hawaii on April 17th, and he doesn't expect to arrive home until early June. You can track his progress on a map you'll find on his website. The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System Region 1 Newsletter reports that during March, likely as a consequence of the current military situation, they noticed an increase of transmissions in unknown modes in the HF amateur radio bands. In many cases, their most probable function was to act as jammers, which are signals intentionally transmitted on top of other transmissions in order to disrupt or nullify their reception. Most of these signals were received in the 20 and 40 meter amateur bands. On several occasions, the monitors also received a signal whose possible function, given its behavior of short but powerful bursts jumping in an organized and repetitive ways along the radio spectrum, could be to act as an ionosonde. An ionosonde is a radar used to examine the ionosphere in order to determine the optimum frequency for the transmission of signals in the HF bands. Also, military modes that had not been observed for a long time, such as the Russian digital mode T-231A, also known as Mahovic, were also seen. Throughout the month, the annoying and high rate of reception of radar transmissions also increased. The Russian over-the-horizon radar container once again topped the list in terms of the number of transmissions, being received on several occasions, making up to four simultaneous transmissions on the amateur 40-meter band. It was also observed on the 30, 20, 17, 15 and 12-meter amateur bands. The British Royal Air Force over the horizon radar, located at the UK Sovereign Base Area in Cyprus, also increased its transmissions. It was received mainly on the 15-metre amateur band, although it was also observed on the 17- and 10-metre bands. Transmissions sent by the Iranian radar, which is additional to being received almost daily on its usual transmission frequency of 28.86 MHz, made simultaneous transmissions that jumped frequency every four minutes over the entire 10 meter band. There was a significant increase during March in the number of frequency shift keying type transmissions on well-known frequencies like 7080 or 7193 kHz, and also some new ones appeared. An example of these was the daily transmission on 18107 kHz by the Russian Navy station RDL, transmitting encrypted signals using mode F1B for automatic reception and mode F1A, which is telegraphy, for oral reception. The monitoring team also noted the reception of transmissions sent by intruders on the amateur 40 meter band using modes allowing the displaying of images on the waterfall of SDR type receivers related to the military conflict currently occurring. In addition to the usual voice intrusions on 40 meters that the team usually nickname the Ukrainian-Russian radio war, they have received on numerous occasions similar types of transmissions in this band, including similar content. Also, close to 7100 kHz, but also noticed on the 20 meter band, several Morse transmissions of unknown origin were sent by stations not identifying themselves as a radio station.
The International Amateur Radio Union Monitoring System newsletter can be read at www.iaru-r1.org. And if you want to try identifying military transmissions, a guide can be found on the Signal Identification Guide Wiki at www.sigidwiki.com. The National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting, in conjunction with the Westchester Amateur Radio Association, has announced expanded hours for the museum during the 2022 Dayton Hamvention. The museum will be open for the following, Thursday, May 19th from 1 to 9 p.m., Friday, May 20th from 1 to 9, Saturday, May 21st from 1 to 9, and Sunday, May 22nd from 1 to 5 p.m. Admission is $10 at the door. The WC8VOA amateur radio station will be available to operate during these times. The museum is a short drive from Hamvention, down either Interstate 75 or Route 42 from Xenia. Exhibits include the Robert Drake Collection of Radios and the recently restored WLWO and W8XAL transmitters. This transmitter was used to provide the very first broadcast of the Voice of America into occupied Europe on February 1st of 1942. A completed diorama showing antenna configurations of the original operation which occupied nearly one square mile, is also on display. Docents and ARS operators will be available to enhance your visit to the museum. For further information, you can visit us at voamuseum.org or wc8voa.org on the web. You can also find us on Facebook and National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting. The museum's regular hours are Saturdays and Sundays from 1 to 4 p.m. The museum is located at 8070 Tylersville Road, Westchester, Ohio. The Hawaii Amateur Radio Emergency Service conducted an operational readiness drill on April 16th to evaluate their emergency communications abilities if severe weather were to hit the state and disable regular communications. With more details on the drill, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report through League Headquarters. That exercise simulated a four-day period of catastrophic rain and wind covering the Hawaiian Islands from Kauai to the Big Islands, and it took out power, internet, and cell phone towers. State, local, and federal agencies participated in the exercise to evaluate ARES members and non-members for radio operations and procedures. There are 3,800 amateur radio operators in the islands, and preparing for storms and severe weather is a little bit different than it is in the states. But all indication is that that drill went well, and everybody now is ready for whatever comes along for Hawaii. ARRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, expressed that it's important for all agencies to work together during emergencies. It is great to see ARIES work this closely with local and state government agencies to overcome obstacles and provide emergency communications for the public, Johnston said. Hawaii faces challenges that are different than other areas, but the general practice of preparing and exercising is the same anywhere you go. The Hawaii Office of Homeland Security participated in the drill, and OHS Administrator Frank Pace echoed the importance of all agencies working together. We support the statewide training of amateur radio operators as part of the incident command system structure, and the deployment of radio stations operated by volunteers in preparing for disaster situations, he said. The Office of Homeland Security Statewide Interoperability Coordinator Everett Kanashigi said that coordinating all efforts is critical. It is exciting to see the incorporation of innovative technology, such as the amateur radio developed GPS software mapping capability, said Kanashigi. Having multiple outlets for communication during a crisis is critical. An article about the exercise was published by KITV Channel 4 Island News. To learn more about amateur radio and ARIES in Hawaii, visit www.hamradiohawaii.com or the Ham Radio Hawaii Facebook group. In recognition of World Amateur Radio Day held on April 18th, the International Telecommunication Union published articles and social media posts highlighting various facets of ham radio. With more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this special report. In an interview with ITU News, Philip Springer, KD6SP, chair of the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth Working Group, and an article, How to Become a Ham Radio in the Digital Era by Nick Sienis, SV3SJ. He's the ITU study group advisor and head of the ITU radio station 4U1ITU. Springer, who's 24 years old, earned his ham radio license when he was 9 years old. 
In his interview with ITU News, he explained the variety of operating techniques and social connections that is part of what motivates young people to become active in ham radio in an increasingly digital world. He said it's technical parts like experimenting with radio science, soldering, developing, and building electronics in practice, and not just theory. He also, secondly, they are uh, connecting with each other, connecting with other communities, meeting radio operators from around the world. And he also said they're connecting with other cultures. They practice foreign language, visit other countries, and get on the air so they can have so-called expeditions. Springer is also featured in an ITU video on YouTube, and you can watch that video there on YouTube. You can also see other videos from this ITU uh, article series there on Twitter. So all you have to do is type in the letters ITU, and you can watch all of those videos. In his article, Sinansis explained that the International Telecommunication Union plays a key role in amateur radio by overseeing the standardization and regulatory processes of the radio communication sector, with special emphasis on its utility in emergency communications. The ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and the International Amateur Radio Union contributes to the work of the ITU as a sector member. World Amateur Radio Day marks the annual anniversary of the International Amateur Radio Union formed in Paris on April 18, 1925. The International Telecommunication Union also celebrated World Amateur Radio Day via posts on Twitter. Every April the 18th, radio amateurs worldwide take to the airwaves in celebration of World Amateur Radio Day, and 2022 was no exception, with special amateur radio activities taking place all over the world. It was on April the 18th in 1925 that the International Amateur Radio Union was formed in Paris, with members from 25 countries, growing to 160 member societies today. The International Telecommunications Union recognizes the IARU as representing the interests of amateur radio, now organized in three IARU regions, representing over three million license holders. Thanks to the work of pioneering amateur radio experimenters in the early years of the last century, it was discovered that ionospheric propagation on shortwave allowed signals to travel much greater distances than the lower frequencies then being used by telephone companies and broadcasters. So, in order to prevent amateur radio from being pushed aside by commercial and national interests, amateur radio pioneers met in Paris in 1925 and founded the IARU. That ensured that at the 1927 International Radio Telegraph Conference, amateur radio secured frequency allocations in the 160, 80, 40, 20 and 10 metre bands. And as one example of interest in World Amateur Radio Day, Pakistan's Tribute newspaper reported that modern communication systems may seem robust, but they prove useless during disasters for the want of power or due to spotty network coverage. In such emergencies, it is still the good old radio amateur or ham radio technology that provides communication links and saves lives. The newspaper said that as the world observes World Amateur Radio Day on the 18th of April, Azadullah Marwat, Alpha Papa 2 Alpha Uniform Mike, the Vice President of the Pakistan Amateur Radio Society, commented that this comparatively old communication system had helped to network people and the government in critical times. Although from a legal background, Asadullah's father worked with walkie-talkies, radio antennas and transmitters, and it had fascinated AP2AUM from his childhood. He said that he and his father had both joined the Pakistan Amateur Radio Society in 1992 and got their licenses. Now both his sons are also license holders. He urged parents to encourage their children to understand and learn ham radio technology so they are capable of helping people in distress during disasters. You can read the full interview at tribune.com.pk. On April 15th of 2022, ARRL President Emeritus Harry Dannels, W2HD, celebrated his 95th birthday, as well as over 80 years of involvement in amateur radio. He served as ARRL President for 10 years, from 1972 to 1982, and the President Emeritus status was conferred on him in 1984. 
Daniels is the only person to have served as president of both ARRL and the Quarter Century Wireless Association. He's an ARRL life member and the oldest member of the Albemarle Amateur Radio Club, which almost 775 members. In an interview, Daniels said that when he was 10 years old, he practiced Morse code with his best friend and was able to master 50 to 60 words a minute. On his birthday, he was visited by his friend Jim Wilson, K4BAV, and his son, Bob Daniels, W2GG, who holds a Ph.D. and is a professor at John Hopkins Medicine Department of Radiology. Harry Daniels summarized his life of experience with amateur radio with a simple statement, I've had fun. Paul Gasco, editor of the 5 MHz newsletter, tells us that the latest New Zealand Amateur Radio Transmitter Society news bulletin, called Infoline No. 450, reports on the current situation regarding use of the 5 MHz or 60 meter band in the country. An update from NZART's Administration Liaison Officer Richard Harkett, Zulu Lima 2 Foxtrot Yankee, talks about the impending expiration of the temporary 60 metre licence. Richard had recently spoken with the New Zealand regulator, the RSM, and is waiting on them to issue a new general user radio licence, known as a GURL. Until they do, the status quo continues. On the 7th of May 2021, New Zealand amateurs were granted access to the WRC15 amateur secondary allocation of 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz under a temporary 12-month sub-license due to be reviewed with the regulator, with a view to it being permanently added to the general New Zealand amateur radio license provided no interference issues had arisen. To date, 271 sub-licenses have been issued. You can read info line number 450 by going to www.nzart.org.nz and NZART has dedicated 60 metre band pages at www.nzart.org.nz forward slash info. John E. Ross, KD8IDJ, is the new ARRL news editor. Ross was selected for the position following the recent retirement of Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, from the role, which includes producing news content for the ARRL website, the weekly ARRL letter, the happenings and amateur radio world columns in QST, and voicing the weekly ARRL audio news. Ross has served as the public information coordinator for the ARRL Ohio section for the past 10 years. He is an award-winning journalist, broadcast engineer, and currently holds an amateur extra class license. Ross got his start in broadcasting while in high school as the first student announcer for WCBE Radio in Columbus, Ohio. He has worked as an on-air radio and television news anchor, news director, program host, and personality, as well as voice talent for many commercials and documentaries. He was the first voice of the Ameritech cell phone system when it went on the air in 1989. After graduating from the Ohio State University and playing in the OSU marching band, he had dual careers as vice president and associate for Wilson Group Communications, a Columbus-based public relations, media relations, and crisis management firm. He recently retired from AT&T after 28 years as a network analyst. Ross is also a veteran serving six years in the United States Army and Army Reserve and a six-time recipient of the President's Volunteer Service Award for helping disabled and homeless veterans. Submissions for the ARRL letter and ARRL news can be emailed to Ross. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte here on this end, on this other side of the microphone, talking at you. And you know, geeks have no interest in explaining how this stuff works to the, the world of the normal. Because the, the geeks, frankly, we were shunned in high school. We were mocked. We didn't get to go to the dances. Nobody liked us. We were on the AV squad or the chess club, or in my case, both. And, uh, and we're bitter. So now that we understand how all this stuff works, and you don't... <laughs> Ah, the worm turns. <laughs> Technology. That's what we talk about. The GDPR, which I am basically in favor of, the, uh, the European General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, 
which affects all Europeans, all people living in the EU, has all sorts of features. But one you probably noticed a lot lately. You know when you go to a website and there's that little pop-up that says, this site uses cookies, okay? And you click okay, and it's like, why do they keep asking me that? By the way, here's a funny thing. <laughs> here's a humorous little note. If you say no to that, it'll keep asking you. Because how does it know whether you've said yes or no? It saves a cookie. That's what cookies are. They're, for the most part, pretty benign. It was a little bit of a overreach to say, oh, you got to warn people if you use cookies. All cookies are, are, are the settings for your site. That's why they were created. Cookies are really called persistent client side state information. They should have called them pixies. I don't know why they didn't. Would have been nicer. Cookies, that's cute though, right? Yeah. The idea is when you go to a website, it remembers where you left off. If you go to Facebook, you don't want to log in every single time. So the f when you log in, it saves your login information as a cookie. and says, well, this, this person is this person. And it's on your computer. It's not. They don't save it. They save it on your computer. And that way you can go back to Facebook and not have to log in each time. Any site where you've logged in once but don't have to re-log in is using cookies. Cookies are really mostly benign. The only reason they've gotten a bad name is there, there are some people who use cookies to kind of track your travels on the web and the way that works you know um well for instance facebook so when facebook you log in it sets a cookie that is a facebook cookie that says who you are basically it's a token it's attached to your identity and it's useful every time you go to facebook that's a first party cookie where you're on the site and it's the cookie set by the site first party cookie there the concept of third party cookies exists so if I go to Starbucks, on my computer, there's a Facebook cookie. It is illegal, uh, according to the World Wide Web Consortium or somebody. I mean, they're not going to throw you in jail. But it's not, the cookies are not, third-party cookies are not supposed to be read. Facebook can't read its cookie when you're at the Starbucks site, unless, unless the Starbucks site has a Facebook like button on it, or anything, any content from Facebook on it, because... That content gets loaded from Facebook servers, and suddenly that third-party Facebook cookie is now a first-party cookie again because content's being loaded for Facebook. And when it's being loaded from Facebook, Facebook can also say, hey, is there a Facebook cookie here by any chance? That's how the like button knows it's you. You press that like button, that thumbs up button, it's, it checks and says, oh, yeah, I see it's Leo, and, uh, and it adds the like to your account. And that's how third-party cookies can be sometimes used to track you because anytime you go to a site with a Facebook like button or any Facebook content, Facebook can see you're there. And so they can see all the places you go. Why else did Facebook create this like button? It's not so that you can like stuff, so that they can track you. And it's for that reason that many browsers say block third-party cookies, do not allow them. You should always turn that on as a privacy thing. Turn on any fingerprinting technology, turn any fingerprinting blocking technology because you, they, you don't want to be tracked as you go from site to site. The cookies are great for the individual site. They save you a lot of time. And that's why this GDPR pop-up, we use cookies, <laughs> is dopey. Because, of course, every site uses cookies. Notice it's on every site. The only site it's not on are sites where people from Europe can't visit. But every other site it's on, and that's why you say, yeah, go ahead. Because otherwise, you'd have to see that pop up every time, and you'd have to log in every time, and all be all sorts of inconveniences. That's what cookies are for. Sometimes, I think the general data protection regulation GDPR is a good idea in general. But it has some things that are weird. For instance, you might have seen this story this week in the BBC. A little dispute between a, a, a grandmother and her daughter. Grandma was posting pictures of the grandkids on Facebook. Well, of course she was. That's what grandmas do. But the daughter didn't like it. Daughter said, Grandma, I don't want pictures of my kids on the Internet. A lot of, a lot of parents do that. I understand. For privacy reasons. I don't want pictures of my kids on the Internet. She said, Grandma, take them down. Grandma said, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Those are my grandkids. I want pictures. I want my friends to see my grandkids. Grandma, take those down. She actually went to court, the daughter did, and the judge ruled that this was in the, within the scope of the GDPR and ordered grandma to take them down. Now, GDPR does not normally apply to what they call purely personal or household processing of data, 
But because it's on a social site, it's on Facebook, those photos could end up in the hands of third parties, of course. The woman, the grandma, has to remove the photos or pay a fine of 50 euros every day for every day she fails to comply for a maximum fine of 1,000 euros. And if she posts more pictures of the grandkids, that's another 50 euros a day. <laughs> Where's the problem here? And probably not GDPR, probably between the mother and daughter more than anything else. But that's an example of how, despite the fact that I think the general data protection regulation is a good thing. We have in California, the California Privacy Act, which is also a good thing. That'll be going, most of it isn't yet in effect, but will be going into effect soon. I think that's a good thing. But there are, but this is the problem. It's hard to regulate technology without some messes, a little bit of mess here and there. And boy, that, that cookie thing bugs the crud out of me. Does it, does it bother you every time you go to site? I guess we're used to it now. That's the other side, by the way, of that kind of regulation. Here in California, we had a um, some years ago a ballot measure called Prop 65. And it said that the state has to, it requires a warning it's the, officially the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986. That's how old it is. 1986. It's 34 years old now. It requires the state to maintain and update a list of chemicals known to the state to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. But it also requires that any place any of those chemicals may appear, such as a, well, everywhere, a parking garage or whatever, you have to put up a sign saying Prop 65 warning. This, there's toxic chemicals around here. They could cause cancer or birth defects. And no, oh, oh, oh. what's the upshot of that? Every place you go has that sign. So it's meaningless. You don't pay any attention to it. You ignore it, right? I mean, what are you going to do? Not go anywhere? Same thing with these cookies. It has the exact opposite intent because what it really does is it, it dulls you to the real danger, minor but specific danger of cookies tracking you. And just makes it be, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Put the sign away. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Researchers stopped an attack on the Ukrainian power grid. Researchers from ESET and Microsoft discovered a new variant of an old piece of malware from 2016. Now, that malware was used by Sandworm a.k.a. Fancy Bear, a.k.a. the Russian military intelligence, the GRU, in 2016 to cut the power in Ukraine. They couldn't even come up with a new virus. Six years later, you're still using the old one? Well, that's maybe why Microsoft and ESET caught it. Stopped the attack before the power grid was brought down. So we've been going back and forth. Why haven't the Russians, you know, uh, doing everything nasty that they're doing? Why haven't they tried to uh, do a little cyber warfare on uh, on the on Ukraine and us? Frankly, well, maybe this is why <laughs> they've been busy. They haven't had time to make any new viruses. I guess I don't know. Sometimes sanctions. You know, a lot of a lot of tech companies issuing sanctions against Russia. That's good. We got to do something. Got to do something. TikTok purged, blocked all uh, non-Russian content on TikTok in Russia. You know, that didn't work so well because what did get through? All Russia propaganda. So effectively, TikTok turned itself into a Russian tool for Russian propaganda. That didn't work. That did not work. Sometimes the sanctions are uh, have unintended consequences. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In 1932, at the height of the Great Depression, Bill Halligan, W9AC, age 33, formed a new company. He called his new business the Halicrafters. The name was chosen as a composite of the two words Halligan and Handcrafted. Bill adopted the creed, Handcraft makes perfect, 
and it was used in the first logo of the new Enterprise in late 1932. A few radio sets were built, the S1 through the S3, at an old manufacturing plant at 417 North State Street in Chicago. Immediately, the young Hallicrafters company was beset with problems. Most of the hams these new radios were designed for hadn't yet recovered from the Great Depression and did not have the money to buy the radios. As of this wasn't enough, RCA came down hard on Hallicrafters for patent infringements, insisting that no more radios could be built until they granted Hallicrafters a license, which they had no intention of doing. Bill didn't give up. Procuring as many orders for his radios as possible, he contracted with a licensed manufacturer to build them in small production runs of 50 or 100 sets. He had to use these orders themselves for collateral, an arrangement that at best was very limiting. What Hallicrafters needed was a license to build under the RCA patents. In 1933, Silver Marshall Incorporated went into bankruptcy and Bill saw an opportunity to get his coveted license. A deal was engineered. Bill and Hallicrafters took over Silver Marshall Incorporated, renaming it the Silver Marshall Manufacturing Company and operating it from the State Street address. This relationship was also plagued with financial problems and ended in late 1934. Bill was released from his obligations to Silver Marshall with the help of the Echophone Radio Company. Echophone was also in financial trouble. For all practical purposes, it was out of business. But they had a 50,000 square foot plant and a good RCA license. Bill struck a deal with the owner of Echophone and the two companies merged with Hallicrafters being the dominant partner. During the first few months, the company did contract work for other radio manufacturers and large mail order houses in order to build its cash reserves. In late 1935, they started producing their own line of communication receivers, which we are all familiar with. The SX-9 Super Skywriter was the first model to be produced in significant quantities. Hallicrafters' policy was to build a quality product with all the state-of-the-art advances and features at a price that was affordable. With this policy and good management, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. By 1938, Hallicrafters was the most popular manufacturer of communications receivers in the U.S. and was doing business in 89 other countries. Bill decided on another policy that as new features and technical advances were made, Hallicrafters would bring out new models rather than just upgrade the same basic model. This explains the proliferation of different models which in a three-year period from 1936 through 1938 had reached 23. Until 1938, the production was limited to receivers and associated accessories. Now it was time to produce transmitters. The onslaught of World War II took the U.S. by surprise. There was a shortage of military radio equipment and tremendous government demand for electronic equipment of all types. Many of the existing Hallicrafters products and designs were pressed into military service. The company geared up for wartime production and was responsible for many new designs and innovations. Probably the best known of these were the HT-4, the BC-610, and the SCR-299. Production of ham radio gear and related items was all but suspended until 1945. By August of 1945, the war was over and so were wartime production and most government contracts. It was time again to produce ham radio equipment. A new line of consumer electronics was needed to satisfy a public hungry for products they had gone without for over five years. The old plant had served Hallicrafters well during the war years, but the company needed a modern image for their facility and product line in the post-war period. A new plant was designed and built at 4401 West 5th Avenue in Chicago. This would be the company's home for the next 20 years. The products were given a modern look with the help of Raymond Lowy, a well-known industrial designer of the time. 
One of the first post-war sets produced in the new facility was the SX-38. The logo was again changed, this time to the familiar Circle H. Production also began on the new line of consumer electronics, including radio phonograph units of all shapes and sizes, AM-FM receivers, clock radios in brightly colored Bakelite cases, and television receivers, the first of which was the T-54. Many of the consumer products bore the name Echophone, which had all been but forgotten by this time. Competition was stiff in the consumer electronics field, and this Halicrafters line never really took hold, although it stayed in production until the late 1950s. Even so, the company was doing better than ever, employing 2,500 people by 1952. The 1950s were very successful for the company. The United States' focus during the 50s was civil defense, so many Halicrafters products from this period bore the names like Civic Patrol and Defender. Some of the ham radio products became classics, like the HT32 and the SX-101. Much of this equipment is still in use today and is sought after by nostalgia buffs and collectors. By 1958, Bill Sr. wanted to retire and the company was sold. Little is known about this transaction, but apparently it failed and the Halligans returned to resume control of the corporation a short time later. In 1963, Halicrafters purchased Radio Industries Incorporated of Kansas City, running it as a subsidiary. Radio Industries produced many of the ham radio accessories and some major equipment like the HT-45. Also during this period, Halicrafters was the corporate sponsor of REACT, which was formed in 1962. The Halligans continued operations until about 1966, when the company was sold to the Northrop Corporation. This ended forever the Halligans' involvement in Halicrafters. Northrop moved the company to a new plant in Rolling Meadows, Illinois, and modified the logo again. While a subsidiary of Northrop, Halicrafters produced ham radio products for a few more years, but the main function was producing paramilitary equipment in Northrop's Defense Systems Division, much of it in El Paso, Texas. For all practical purposes, the last ham radio item produced was the FPM 300 in 1972 and a few accessories through 1974. There were also some CB units and portable AM-FM shortwave sets of Japanese origin released under the Halicrafters name. At this point, Northrop turned Halicrafters over to its partner, Wilcox. The annual sales of Halicrafters have been falling off sharply since 1970. On December 4, 1975, Wilcox sold the company to the Breaker Corporation of Dallas, Texas. Breaker packed up 14 semi-trailer loads of Halicrafters records and parts and moved the company to Grand Prairie, Texas. They set up shop there with several former Halicrafters employees of the late 60s and 70s who relocated to Texas. A few more CBs and various portable radios of Japanese and Taiwanese origin were released, but Breaker began to suffer severe financial difficulties. Around 1979, Breaker ceased doing business and Halicrafters along with it. On August 24, 1979, Clarence E. Long engineered a purchase of the name, logos, and what was left of the company. A new corporation called Halicrafters International was set up in Miami. It also had international trademarks. Long set up shop and hired a large staff in anticipation of receiving large government contracts to build paramilitary radios for the armed forces. The new Halicrafters International had to prove to the government that it could handle the contracts as well as the old firm had. Something went wrong, however. Long's plans failed to be approved and Halicrafters lost the contracts. In the early 1980s, Long set up a plant somewhere in the New England states and also had convinced several well-known people in other parts of the company to join in the new venture. Despite all this activity, Long was in serious financial and legal trouble. He declared bankruptcy on June 1, 1988 in San Antonio, Texas. All of his property, including the Halicrafters name, 
logos and whatever records were saved were made property of a court appointed trustee since this time the helicrafters name has not been used and for all practical purposes is non-existent except in the memory of ham radio operators in our next installment we will continue looking at fallen flags in the amateur radio field this is bill continelli w2xoy for this week in amateur radio it's time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us every week by tad cook k7ra in seattle washington who reports that solar flares emerged daily over the last reporting week, April 14th through the 20th. On April 20th, spaceweather.com reported solar activity is intensifying and that over the past 24 hours, there were 19 solar flares, including six M-class events and a powerful X2.2 class flare. A week ago, we knew solar activity would rise, but the reality exceeded expectations. As predicted, a coronal mass ejection hit Earth's magnetic field on April 14th. Its impact sparked a moderately strong G2-class geomagnetic storm, which peaked around 1800 UTC. Apparently due to the further increasing solar radiation, the disturbance was mainly accompanied by an improvement in the ionospheric propagation of decameter waves, 10 meters, which also applied to the following development. Activity prevailed in growing hotspots in the northeast quadrant of the solar disk. In the following days, the activity of the southwestern areas increased, including the X2.2 class flare on April 20th at 0357 UTC when it came from a far side sunspot. And finally, on April 21st at 0157 UTC, a strong M9.6 class solar flare was detected. The source was the sunspot complex AR2993-94, which is almost directly facing Earth. So he expects the intensified solar wind in the coming days to affect the Earth's magnetosphere and ionosphere. The daily sunspot numbers average 64.4, 30 points higher than last week, and the average daily solar flux rose 30 points from 103.1 to 133.9. On April 21st, a huge array of active Earth-facing sunspots pushed the daily sunspot number clear up to 119, high above the average for the week of 64.4. Even with all the flares and coronal mass ejections, geomagnetic indicators were lower, with the average planetary A and dice going from 16.9 to 14.6, and the middle latitude numbers from 12.6 to 10.9. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux looked moderate, but the outlook improved between April 20th and the following day with flux values at 160 on April 22nd through the 29th, 125 on April 30th, 130 on May 1st through the 4th, 125 on May 5th, and it will be 130 on May 6th and 7th. And finally, looking at the predicted planetary A index, it'll be 5 and 12 on April 22nd and 23rd, 8 on April 24th and 25th, 5 on April 26th through the 28th, then 18, 12, and 8 on April 29th through May 1st, 5 on May 2nd through the 5th, and then 8, 15, 12, and 8 on May 6th, all the way through the 9th. The Voice of America's Bethany Relay Station sits alone in a field alongside the busy Tylersville Road in northern Cincinnati at the end of a long driveway. Few take the time to investigate its purpose. Why does this mammoth, government-funded Art Deco monument still remain? Why is it vital to radio technology, world peace and a free press? Walk inside for a tour and the first stop is a room full of ham radio enthusiasts and you'll be met by a guide who has all the answers. Off the lobby inside Bethany, our guide explains the presence of Whiskey Charlie 8 Victor Oscar Alpha, a permanent amateur radio station in the heart of the Voice of America's first home. Most days here, hobbyists send shortwave communications all over the world, trying to connect with other radio hams. Clad with tire-sized headphones, twisting knobs on all sorts of archaic equipment, they finally make contact with Nova Scotia. It's a weather report, basic ham fodder. One of the operators commented that it's like a competition, seeing how far they can talk. The only things that can't be discussed are politics and religion. 
As such, it's mostly weather, geographical coordinates, and historical anecdotes that get swapped. There's also a real-time projection on a screen that shows when the International Space Station is within earshot. Leyland Height, curator and engineer at this National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting, said that a little bit of shortwave goes a long way. Even though not many people still have shortwave radios, there's a message getting across. There's still a need for this information, especially in countries like North Korea and Russia, where they try to jam Voice of America, but they've found ways around that. Height is not, of course, speaking for the amateur radio signals emitting from Bethany, but for the larger mission of Voice of America when it began broadcasting in July of 1944. That's the reason Bethany exists. And even though the station ceased its Voice of America relay to the world in 1994, it's still on the air. There are still shortwave broadcasts of VOA jamming the jammers and spreading news where the internet is censored or completely decimated. You can read more at eu.columbusalive.com, where there's some great photos of the transmitting station and its futuristic control room. An emergency response team of teens, some of them amateur radio operators, has received an award from a top United States government agency. A high school emergency response team that includes several amateur radio operators has been recognized by federal officials for their crisis preparedness work. The U.S. Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, has presented its Region 6 Youth Preparedness Award to the Clovis High School Teen Community Emergency Response Team in Clovis, New Mexico. The team is known by the acronym CERT. The team has been training under the guidance of the city's Emergency Management Director, Dan Hearding, KG5DTV, who shares the award with them. According to a news story on the KCBD-TV website, the young CERT members have already been deployed to three community events and collectively donated 856 hours of their time. Canadian Amateur Radio Licensing Course is getting underway. Candidates for Canada's Basic Level Amateur Radio Operator Certificate are beginning their studies on Sunday, April 24th and will continue through Thursday, June 30th. This is an online course for anyone interested in a Canadian operating certificate, including candidates in overseas countries. The classes are being conducted with the help of the Annapolis Valley Amateur Radio Club of Nova Scotia. The coursework prepares candidates for the Innovation, Science, and Economic Development Canada Basic Qualification Level Operator Certificate Exam. Al Penny, Victor Oscar 1 November Oscar, is the instructor for the three-hour classes which meet on Thursday evenings and Sunday afternoons. To inquire about costs and registration, contact the course administrator via email at basic course, that's one word, at rac.ca. The sessions are being recorded, so should anyone miss a class, they may catch up on the material. After a difficult period of cancellations of in-person gatherings around the world, Europe's number one amateur radio event, Ham Radio Friedrichshafen, is calling itself a reunion with friends, a theme shared by another of the world's other major ham exhibitions, Hamvention, in Xenia, Ohio, in the United States. The event website says that Germany looks forward to playing host to the world at the 45th International Amateur Radio Exhibition at the Neue Messe in Friedrichshafen from June 24th to the 26th. It is important to note that tickets are only available online, so those attending must have tickets in hand when they arrive at the venue. Tickets can either be printed or displayed at the event from a mobile device. For full details, including the currently in effect COVID-19 health protocols, you can visit the event's website. Foundations of Amateur Radio Antennas and propagation are the two single most discussed topics in our hobby. That and how an FT8 contact isn't real. Not a day goes by without some conversation about what antenna is the best one and by how much. In my opinion, it's a futile effort made all the worse by so-called experts, explaining in undeniable gobbledygook, or sometimes even using science, just how any particular antenna is a compromise. The truth is that most conductive materials radiate to more or less a degree. Sometimes there's enough of that to make it outside your backyard, into the antenna of a fellow hobbyist. To make a point, as is my want, over the past months I've been conducting an experiment. It's the first in a series all related to antennas and propagation. As has been said, the difference between fiddling and science is writing it down, so this is me writing it down. I'm using the tools available to me to explore the various attributes of my station and how it affects what's possible. 
I will observe that this is within the dynamic nature of the environment. So the solar cycle, solar events, thunderstorms and noise are making an impact. No doubt I'll create a visualization that links some of those extra variables, but for now I'm just noting that these external events affect what I'm doing. You might recall that I took delivery of a whisper beacon a few months ago. If you're unfamiliar, Whisper or Weak Signal Propagation Reporter is a tool that allows a station to transmit a time-synchronized signal on a specific frequency, so other stations can look for and attempt to decode it. Think of it as a timed Morse code signal, and you'll have a pretty close understanding of what it does. The beacon I purchased was a 200 milliwatt Zactec 80-10 desktop transmitter, built by Harry Sierra Mike 7 Papa November Victor. It can operate on all the HF bands I'm licensed for and can run all day, every day. It's time synchronized using a supplied GPS antenna and powered by a micro USB cable. It's currently connected to my vertical antenna. That vertical antenna is a homebrew helically wound whip tuned for the 40 meter band clamped to the side of my metal patio roof. It's fed by an SGC 237 antenna coupler which is held by magnets to the roof. A 75 ohm RG6 quad shield coax cable about 20 meters long left over from my satellite dish installation days, is connected via several adapters and coax switches to the beacon. This is not a fancy setup by any stretch of the imagination, but it's my station and what I use to get on air to make noise, and that's the whole point of this exercise. You might recall that one of the reasons I want to learn Morse is so I can hear an NCDXF beacon and know which one I'm hearing on my own station. In many ways, this is a different way to approach the same problem. Said plainly, how do I determine what propagation is like for me, right now, on my own gear? There are countless tools available, from the Voice of America VOA cap propagation prediction through the graphs and charts on clublog.org, to the space weather services run by the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. All of these tools have one thing in common, they don't use your own gear. Unsurprisingly, you're likely to wonder what it is that I can achieve with a mere 200 milliwatt transmitter and a vertical. Turns out, quite a lot. As of right now, my whisper beacon has been heard multiple times over the past three months in the Canary Islands, over 15,000 kilometres away. The watts per kilometre calculation puts that at over 76,000 kilometres per watt. Not bad for a little amateur station located in the middle of a residential suburb. Did I mention that this was on the 10 metre band? I was asked if I would put a pin in my DXCC map tracking the countries for each of these whisper reports. And my answer to that is no. This is not a contact, this is a propagation ping. I suppose that I could, if I really wanted to argue the point, which I don't, use a pin if I had a reciprocal report from the other station within a set period of time. But that's not why I'm doing this. The purpose of this exercise is to discover what my station is capable of, what propagation is like, how it changes over time, how uniform my radiation pattern is, and how much of the globe can hear my signal. One observation to make is that much of the west coast of the United States is a similar distance away from me, but so far there are no reports from that continent. As a quick and dirty test, I'm using my Yesu radio and 5 watts for the next day to see if this is an edge case, or if there's something else going on. For example, my house has a peak metal roof to the west of my antenna. Is it possible that it's affecting the radiation pattern, or is there something else going on, like the neighbor's house that sits to the east? For all I know, the noise floor in the Canary Islands is significantly better than anywhere in the USA, but only time will tell. I've recently taken delivery of a multiband vertical antenna which I'm planning to use to replace my current vertical. The main reason being that my antenna coupler cannot tune with 200 milliwatts, and to do band hopping I'd have to retune manually each time, not something that's sustainable 24 hours a day. No doubt that change will bring other discoveries, but then I'm keeping track. The intent of all of this is that you can experiment with your own station, test ideas, trial a setup, keep a log, and discover new things that your station presents to you. Amateur radio is never just about one thing. It's always a dozen different things, all at the same time. What are you going to discover next? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Appalachian Trail Golden Packet event, an, an annual tradition started by WB4APR in 2009, is set for July 16th this year. The goal is to set up 15 temporary VHF, UHF, APRS stations on mountaintops along the Appalachian Trail and send messages end-to-end -end between Georgia and Maine. 
For more information, you can visit atgoldenpacket.net, and that'll tell you what they are doing and all of the exact times of this event. International Telecommunication Union plays a key role in amateur radio by overseeing the standardization and regulatory processes of the radio communication sector, with special emphasis on its utility in emergency communications. ITUR study cycles provide the vehicle for the evolution of amateur radio spectrum. Through the International Amateur Radio Union, an ITU member, the radio amateur community makes important contributions to the preparatory studies for each World Radio Communication Conference. These studies help optimize radio spectrum sharing and ensure avoidance of harmful interference to and from other radio communication services. The upcoming World Radio Conference 23 will consider operational and technical measures that ensure the protection of the radio navigation satellite service operating in the same frequency band 1240 to 1300 MHz as the amateur service. The ITU radio station also known as 4U1ITU, is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year. Radio societies and renowned awards have attributed a special status to the station, with which contacts are highly solicited. At the same time, the Verembe building that houses the station at ITU's Geneva headquarters will soon be dismantled to make space for a new one. For six decades, the 4U1 ITU station has been a landmark for many ITU delegates who contacted it as radio hams or used it to contact other radio amateurs. In its future home at the top of the ITU's new headquarters, this long history and special status will keep 4U1 ITU active for many years to come. The Radio Society of Great Britain Annual General Meeting will take place on Saturday the 23rd of April at 12 noon and it will be streamed live. Voting in the RSGB elections closes at 9am on Thursday the 21st of April, so please use your vote. Full details of the event can be found on the RSGB website at www.rsgb.org forward slash AGM. You won't be able to ask questions live during the AGM, so RSGB members have until 9am on Wednesday, April the 20th to submit their online questions for the RSGB AGM. Submit your question for the RSGB board members to answer by going to the RSGB website and following the link to AGM 2022. The RSGB has released a video celebrating the centenary of the 1921 transatlantic tests. The Radio Society of Great Britain and America's ARRL have been celebrating the centenary of the transatlantic tests and this video highlights the fantastic exhibition put on by the National Heritage Centre in Saltcoats, Scotland. It also details the 1921 message reenactment by the Kilmarnock and Loudoun Amateur Radio Club and the 160 metre transatlantic QSO party. You can find out more about the transatlantic tests by going to www.rsgb.org forward slash transatlantic hyphen tests. And the video called Celebrating the Centenary of the Transatlantic Tests is available on the RSGB YouTube channel. Ham radio and Freemasonry are both integral parts of American history and subcultures in their own right. Both also boast strong local contingents, the American Radio Relay League headquartered in Newington and the Sequin No. 140 Masonic Lodge is one of the most active groups of Freemasons in Connecticut. The Lodge hosted officers from the ARRL for a banquet dinner April 7th, recognizing the organization's 100 plus years of service and contribution to the emergency communications worldwide. Worshipful Master John Fossen presented the group with a plaque on behalf of the Lodge, and Newington Mayor Beth Del Buono read a proclamation from the town. The Masons were built on making good men better, Fossen said. The American Radio Relay League, since they were founded, has been innovators. The past few years has been trying, but the ARRL never stopped for a war or a pandemic. In fact, amateur radio has proved to be vital as an emergency communications tool, since not only does it not rely on a telephone network, a mail carrier, or internet service. 
Our volunteers donate their own personal radio equipment and skills during natural disasters, said Bob Interbitzen, Director of Public Relations and Innovation at the ARRL. When all else fails, ham radio works in a world filled with too much violence and war. The ARRL supports one of the noblest of causes. He was joined at the Lodge by AARRL Director of Operations Bob Noman, Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, Members Services Manager Yvette Vinci, and Assistant Member Services Manager Kim McNeil. It was just 100 years ago this December that ARRL sent a man to Scotland to see if he could receive signals of ham radio operators in America. Inter Blitzen said during his presentation to the Freemasons. He succeeded, and that was the dawn of amateur radio communication. In her proclamation to the ARRL, Del Bono recognized the organization for its dedication to educating the public, encouraging radio experimentation, and providing a public service. ARRL supports the awareness and growth of amateur radio worldwide, she said, and strives for every member to get involved, get active, and get on the air. Interbitson also provided insight to the ARRL scholarship program, an ongoing education of teachers worldwide. Getting a ham radio license is a big step forward in a career path, he pointed out. Businesses like Motorola and Raytheon love to hire electrical engineers who have their ham radio licenses right out of college, he said. There is a practical use for their skills. According to the Masons' publicity chairman, Larry Seidman, there are many Masons and even Lodge members who also happen to be ham radio operators. This past summer, the ARRL hosted a rededication of operations, reopening its world headquarters at 225 Main Street in Newington. Amongst its 158,000-plus members, about 2,000 reside in Connecticut. The organization celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2015. The Ohio Aries NVIS Antenna Day is scheduled for April 23rd, 2022. The purpose of Antenna Day is to learn about, construct, and test near vertical incident skywave or NVIS antennas, as well as to evaluate the ability to conduct communications within a confined geographic area, usually about 400 miles or less. NVIS antennas or cloud burners are very low wire antennas. Because they are close to the ground, the signal is reflected vertically and bounces back off the ionosphere very close to the original location. It is a great time to teach beginners the art of building antennas from scratch, including measuring, cutting, soldering, and deploying. These skills will come in handy throughout their ham radio career. For more information, contact N8BHL at ARRL.net. A celebration of all things wireless, from Marconi and Tesla to modern times, grace the screens of viewers on YouTube and Facebook as the Tesla Science Center on Long Island, New York, marked World Amateur Radio Day on April 18th. For nearly an hour and a half, three active, prominent amateurs on different life paths shared their personal experiences and their hopes for radio's future with viewers and program host Mark Alessi, the center's executive director, Ed Wilson, N2X DD, Vice President of the Suffolk County Radio Club, Ted Rappaport, N9NB, Developer of 5G Wireless Communications, and Major League Baseball legend Joe Rudy, NK7U, described why they prized radio for its emergency capabilities, its role as a spark for experimentation, and for the environment it creates to educate the next generation. The Tesla Science Center is named for inventor Nikola Tesla, whose lab was once located there. The center has been giving special priority to promoting the vast, still untapped potential of radio. He is helping jumpstart an amateur radio group based at the center with a focus on attracting younger operators. Beyond the ham's personal stories of rescue by radio and their hopes for future projects, they shared their enthusiasm for getting more people on the air. When Mark Alessi noted that he is presently not a ham, Ed quickly jumped in to say, Not yet, Mark. Not yet. The Apollo 16 anniversary sparks a special event station at NASA. If you remember NASA's Apollo 16 moon mission, or even if you weren't around back then, you don't want to miss the 50th anniversary celebration of that historic journey, which was the fifth moon landing. NASA on-the-air special event stations around the United States will be on the bands between Saturday, April 23rd and Wednesday, April 27th, marking the milestone. 
Different local NASA radio clubs will be active at different hours, so check the spotting clusters or the NASA on the Air WordPress blog site. The many participating clubs at NASA sites include the Ames Research Center Amateur Radio Club, NA6MF in California, the Glenn Research Center Club, NA8SA in Ohio, the Goddard Space Flight Center Club, Whiskey Alpha 3 NAN in Maryland, and the Stennis Space Center Club, N5SSC in Mississippi. Amateur radio relates to the scouting mission in multiple dimensions, from Cubs to scouting advancement, directly with the Radio Merit Badge, and indirectly through meeting requirements for other merit badges. While an amateur radio license is not required to meet these requirements, the obvious extension of radio interest is obtaining a license and getting on the air. The official Jamboree on the Air program every October gives scouts with a license an opportunity to meet other radio operators on the air. So how do adult scouters learn about resources to help their scouts to learn about completing requirements for radio and other merit badges? How do scouts learn how to talk to astronauts on the International Space Station? How do scouters learn how to get their own radio license? Answers will be found in a new amateur radio and scouting course at Philmont Training Center, which will be held July 10th through the 16th, 2022, at the Scout Training Center in Cimarron, New Mexico. The course is designed to familiarize current scouts who are hams, as well as unlicensed scouts, with the benefits and fun associated with ham radio and its introduction into the Boy Scouts of America program. Since 1918, 200,000 scouts have received the Radio Merit Badge, introducing them to radio technology, communication, and amateur radio. The course is $470 plus housing. The study of communication modes has been a focus of the scouting movement since it arrived in the United States in 1910. The Signaling Merit Badge was among the first set of merit badges available to scouts and was first offered in 1911. It was discontinued in 1992 since the modes of communication of the early 1900s had been displaced by more modern modes of communication. The Wireless Merit Badge was developed in 1918 and its evolution is now the Radio Merit Badge. The Radio Merit Badge helps scouts through rank advancement. The Morse Code Interpreter Strip offers additional special recognition. More about the course and the schedule can be found at radioscouting.website. Registration has begun for amateurs wishing to attend the annual general meeting and virtual conference of the Wireless Institute of Australia. The event, which will be a hybrid of in-person and virtual events, is coming up fast. It's taking place on the 7th of May and will be streamed from Hobart, Tasmania. The focus this year is on Antarctica, and a number of presentations will be exploring the roles that wireless communication has played throughout history, including the Australasian Antarctic Expedition that took place from 1911 to 1914. Microwave experimenter Rex Moncur, VK7MO, who is a former director of the Australian Antarctic Division, will discuss his work at the helm of the division from 1988 to 1999. Peter Yates, VK7PY, and Kim Briggs, VK7KB, who are both with the Australian Antarctic Division, We'll talk about the current challenges facing Antarctic communications. For more information about costs, viewing the live stream, or registering to attend in person, point your web browser at tinyurl.com forward slash YTRET3R. The event is being hosted by the Radio and Electronics Association of Southern Tasmania. The Japanese Antarctica Research Expedition Amateur Radio Station, HA1RL, is conducting a special operation of Children's Day on May 5th from 5 to 1800 Japan Standard Time, where elementary, junior high, and high school students in Japan get priority. In 2022, the 63rd Japan Antarctic Research Expedition at Siowa Station plans to operate special operation of Children's Day on the 21 megahertz band single sideband. When participating in the Special Operation of Children's Day, please be careful to take measures to prevent the new coronavirus infection by yourself. Hand washing, wearing a mask, ensuring social distance, and close action. In addition, if a state of emergency declaration is declared due to the spread of the new coronavirus variant infection, and if the Special Operation is unavoidably canceled, the JARL webpage will guide you. So please be sure to check the page when you participate. 
And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf 4 Hotel Papa Echo. 
The Guardian newspaper in the UK recently carried an article by science editor Ian Sample about plans to beam a new message across the galaxy. The cosmologist Carl Sagan once said that even if the aliens are short, dour and sexually obsessed, if they're here, I want to know about them. Driven by the same mindset, a NASA-led team of international scientists has developed a new message that it proposes to beam across the galaxy in the hope of making first contact with intelligent extraterrestrials. The interstellar missive, known as the beacon in the galaxy, opens with simple principles for communication, some basic concepts in maths and physics, the constituents of DNA, and closes with information about humans, the Earth, and a return address should any distant recipients be minded to reply. The group of researchers, headed by Dr. Jonathan Jiang at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, says that with technical upgrades, the binary message could be broadcast into the heart of the Milky Way by the SETI Institute's Allen Telescope Array in California and the 500-metre Aperture Spherical Radio Telescope in China. In a preliminary paper, which has not been peer-reviewed, the scientists recommend sending the message to a dense ring of stars near the centre of the Milky Way, a region deemed most promising for life to have emerged. The scientists contend that humanity has a compelling story to share and the desire to know of others, and now we have the means to do so. The message, if it ever leaves Earth, would not be a first. The beacon in the galaxy is loosely based on the Arecibo message sent in 1974 from the observatory of the same name in Puerto Rico. That targeted a cluster of stars about 25,000 light years away, so it will not arrive any time soon. Since then, a host of messages have been beamed into the heavens, including an advert for Doritos and an invitation written in Klingon to a Klingon opera in The Hague. Such attempts at interstellar communication are not straightforward. The odds of an intelligent civilization intercepting a message may be extremely low, and even if contact were made, establishing a fruitful conversation could prove frustrating when a response can take tens of thousands of years, and aliens may not even understand the signal. As a test run for the Arecibo message, Frank Drake, its designer, posted the missive to some scientific colleagues, including a number of Nobel laureates. None of them understood it. There are other concerns too. More than a decade ago, Professor Stephen Hawking warned that humans should refrain from sending messages into space in case they attract the wrong sort of attention. Stephen Hawking told a Discovery Channel documentary that if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America, which didn't turn out very well for the Native Americans. You can read the full story at www.theguardian.com. Head for the science pages. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Electron Binders Amateur Radio Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, airs This Week in Amateur Radio, every week on club-owned KOKTLP 90.9. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by... The American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, 
Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers 